to welcome Joel Waldfogel. He's giving um, our first in a series of talks on information economics. Um, Joel is the Frederick R. Capel. Chair in Applied Economics, Capel? Capel. Capel, Chair in Applied Economics at the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. Um, he came, went there from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School where he was the Aaron Krantz Family Professor of Business and Public Policy uh, and where he served as Department Chair and Associate Vice Dean. I wish I had one of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, his main research interests are industrial organization, and law and economics, and he's conducted empirical studies of price advertising, media markets, the operation of differentiated product markets, uh, and issues related to digital products, including piracy, pricing, and revenue sharing. He's published more than 50 art articles in scholarly outlets, including the American Economic Review, the Journal of Political Economy, the RAND Journal of Economics, and he's also published several books by the names of uh, the Tyranny of the Market, Why You Can't Always Get What You Want, and the one I love the most, Scroogeonomics, Why You Shouldn't Buy Presents for the Holidays. <laughs> <laughs> He's also written for Slate. Waldfogel received a BA in economics from Brandeis and has a PhD in economics from Stanford University. He grew up in South Minneapolis, graduating from Washburn High School. <laughs> and now I'll turn it over to you, Joel. <laughs> yeah, that, that must be from my University of Minnesota website. That's yes. where they care about that, that <laughs> fact. But, so oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, yeah, I'll talk about the, this paper. Actually, a little bit of false advertising. I will talk about this paper. But since this is our chance to get to know each other, I, I'm actually going to start by talking about how I got to this paper, not, not in a personal sense, but in a scholarly sense. Then I will talk about this paper. And I also want to talk about where I'm going, because this paper kind of lives at a, at a crossroads between a bunch of things I have been doing and some things I'm starting to do now. I'll assume we're working with the rude economist rules, so you can ask questions anytime. But even if you're not rude, please ask clarifying, especially questions. The deep ones, I'll refer, or, you know, I'll, I'll wait till the end to answer the deep ones. I'll, at least I'll reserve that right. Okay, so in the, the category of how I got here, uh, you know, I did a bunch of work on piracy, and every piracy paper has to start with the the sky is falling slide that shows music industry recorded, uh, you know, music revenue rising, well, from the beginning of time, which in this case is about 1994, but actually it goes back farther that it was rising, and then it reaches 1999, and it begins it begins to fall, I think, and, and that's sort of the picture we, we take away, but that was the, the motivation for a lot of research. I did some of it. Uh, and I guess I would say that the research response that economists had to, to the Napster uh, episode, uh, I would call it a, a kerfuffle about whether file sharing cannibalizes sales. And I, I am going to make a little fun of this research, in part because I participated in it, so I have a right to make fun of it. But let's think about the question that this research was, was trying to answer. Does the ability of people to steal stuff reduce the ability for guys who sell it to generate revenue from trying to sell stuff? Now, the industry knew the answer all the, all the, you know, the whole time. Of course, their knowing isn't really compelling in, in our sense. And even to be fair to the academics, it is a surprisingly hard question to answer. You know, for example, if you look at stuff that gets stolen a lot, well, you might think that if it's being stolen a lot, uh, if we want to study the relationship between stealing and purchase, you, you might notice that stuff that's stolen a lot is also purchased a lot. That might tend to lead you to think that stealing stuff is good for sales. Uh, now, of course, the researchers are sophisticated enough not to have done things that naive, but nevertheless, it is a hard, a hard question to answer. But I'd say the dust has settled and that most people believe that file sharing does reduce sales. And so, you know, I think 1999, Napster, you know, th there's a to put it in economist lingo, there was a, a negative shock to demand or a reduction in the ability for the industry to generate revenue for whatever given uh, kind of quality or quantity of products the industry is bringing forth. And this raises legitimate concerns. Uh, I'm going to use the industry's claimed concerns, but I think that I want to grant these some legitimacy, uh, legitimacy, at least on their face. I mean, what they say uh, is, and you can read their words as well as I can, but they're saying, look, it's expensive to bring products to market. If we can't get revenue, we won't do investment. And then taking it a little bit further, they say, and therefore you will be living in an audio stone age. Well, they don't quite say that, but that's, uh, but that's the concern, right? If it's costly to bring stuff to market, you know, it requires investment. We need revenue to do that. If we don't do that, then that's bad no news, not just for sellers. You know, the early round of research was really concerned with the fortunes of sellers, but this would be bad news for buyers as well, because there's nothing new for you to listen to. 
Now, in addition to these uh, sort of, the, the, well, these concerns, I should say, prompted a lot of uh, attempted policy changes and actual policy changes. I mean, there were things like private action, lawsuits against individual file sharers, but also lots of attempts, some successful, to get the pipes policed. So Hadopi and SOPA and PIPA are less successful, but now the, there's something like this happening, three strikes, some, some various things like this that are happening. So these are real issues that are prompting real policy responses, you know, in response to some genuine concerns. Now that said, um, I guess a couple of years ago, I had what I would characterize as an epiphany. Uh, there's that road to Damascus there. And it occurred to me that revenue reduction, which is really interesting and important for producers, um, is not the most interesting or most important question, really. Uh, I think the, you think about what copyright is for, what copyright is meant to do, meant to induce creation of stuff, or, uh, well, really, it's just meant to induce creation of new stuff. The question is, will the flow of new products continue? At least that struck me as an important unanswered question. And you know, as an aside, and it's funny that I should have to say this at all, but we had ought to worry about consumers as well as producers when we think about whether a copyright policy, uh, or any policy for that matter, is functioning well. And the reason I guess I, you know, I have to say that and then make a point about saying that, if you think about the whole pile of papers that economists were writing, myself included, they really were about what happened to the revenue of the, you know, the major record labels or the traditional incumbent uh, uh, industry. Not that that's a bad thing, but it's just an incomplete thing. Okay, so along with this epiphany, I guess, came another observation, which is at least, you know, if you think about 1999, and not just 1999 in particular, but the last decade and a half or whatever, there are multiple innovations occurring. It's not just file sharing. So file sharing is this innovation that allows people to get stuff without paying for it. But really, if you think we're living through an experiment, it's, it's, it's a compound experiment, not just that negative shock to demand. It's also the case that there have been big changes in the cost of production, promotion, distribution, at least possible that all those things have fallen. And if that were true, then maybe weaker IP, effective IP protection effective meaning through the lens or by way of both technology and, and law, maybe weaker IP protection would be enough to, uh, to sort of maintain the same level of incentives that we had before. But really the question, I think the relevant question, the one that has piqued my interest, has been what's happened to, uh, I use distancing quotes here to avoid the fight we're about to have, but what's happened to the quality of new music or new products uh, since Napster? And my goal in, in, and this again is the precursor to the paper I get to today, but was, my goal was to contribute to an evidence-based discussion of the adequacy of IP protection. And I always kind of chuckle when I think about this word evidence-based, because it's, they talk about evidence-based medicine. And you think, what on earth were they doing before? And we laugh at them, you know, because we're all very serious social scientists and we do everything evidence-based. But the truth is, in contexts like this one, there wasn't that much of an evidentiary basis for public policy. You know, when folks came to, to Washington to complain, the evidence was what's happening to their income, which is really not a very broad evidentiary basis for public policy. So I want to contribute in the same way doctors are getting evidence-based. I wanted to be a little bit evidence-based about copyright. Okay, now this question of quantifying this volume of high quality, and I'll talk about quality in a second before you <coughs> want to strangle me, uh, it's a hard problem. You know, quantifying the volume of high quality new music over time is difficult. Some of the obvious ways one might go about doing it are actually not going to work so well. I mean, you might think, for example, about the number of new works available. Now, that's a little bit appealing, uh, but the vast majority of works get no sales or very, very few sales, so the number of works isn't going to be very informative about the things that, uh, well, I, uh, the way economists would think about well-being generated by products, that would be the well-being experienced by consumers and the well-being experienced by producers, so consumer surplus, profit, producer surplus, and those are all about, well, related to the quantity of things that get consumed, so having a whole bunch of products with no consumption doesn't do much for welfare in those senses. You might think, okay, how about the number of works selling more than some number of copies? 5,000, 10,000, 100,000. That you know, takes a stab at them being consequential, but if you, think about, if you think as I do that we're living in an era of increased stealing, then what it means to surpass any particular threshold is different over time. You have to be better or more worthy of demand in uh, 2000 than you did or in 2010 than you did in 2000 to sell any particular number of copies. So that's not really a very attractive, uh, attractive way to go either. So that leaves us with a problem. Now I'll do the apology about quality or at least the, the pre-explanation. When I say quality, um, what I'm really going to mean is stuff that moves the demand curve around. So just think of it as appeal or service flow or marketability. Uh, those words which are less aesthetically charged. Uh, I mean, 
Having said that, you'll see that one of my measures of quality has something to do with critics and is therefore arguably aesthetic. But really what, I, what I'm after, what I, th what I th think is important here, or, uh, or the question I'm trying to answer has to do with the service flow being generated in this industry by new recorded music products. Okay, so I have two broad approaches. And again, we're still in the pre-paper. Um, I apologize, but I wanted you to understand why I'm, what puzzle it is I'm trying to resolve in the paper that I distributed. So one of the broad approaches is to use, uh, uh, to create a quality index based on critics' best of lists. So these best of the decade, best of all time, that sort of thing. And I'll talk more about that in, in a minute. I know, for example, that every year there's a 10 best. So if we were to look over time at the number on the 10 best list, that would be uninformative. So I have a little better nuanced approach than that. Yeah. Isn't that an aesthetic criteria? That is. And I just said this is, although what I really was interested in was the non-aesthetic. Uh, this was the first one I did. And so I'll do this one first. And then we'll, we'll discuss reasons why we don't believe it and do the ones I like better. But for folks who don't like the other ones, this one still has some appeal. And I have some evidence that the aesthetic one, even though it's aesthetic, it's correlated with demand. So uh, even my non-aesthetic side says that when I didn't have the other kind of evidence, I was really using this as evidence relevant to stuff that moves the market around. Because it is related. I mean, more, not perfectly correlated, but pretty highly correlated. And then I have these two other indices I'll create that are based on what I call vintage service flow. Just to give a hint about what this is now, but talk about it more in a few slides. Suppose uh, you, you knew not only by calendar time, but also by time of release, how much music was being purchased. So for example, suppose you knew that of the music being purchased, or let's say listened to on the radio in 2010, how much of it was originally released in 2010 versus 2009 going back back to 1960 or back to 1800, whatever you like. Well, then you could possibly, and I'll show you how I'll do it, construct indices of the service flow generated by different vintages based on the usage data. And what's appealing about those is that instead of relying on the views of elites, those critics, those snobs, whoever they are, it relies on the consumption decisions of individuals. <laughs> uh, that sounds like a populist claim. I'm just trying to be an economist there, not a populist. Okay. <laughs> So number one, the critics list approach, which again is aesthetic more than I wish it to be, but, but fine. So what I, want is, what I want is an index of the number of works released each year that surpass some constant threshold of, I'll use the word quality, but I really mean appeal. Uh, and so what I use is these critics retrospective best of lists, like the number of albums, uh, best of the decade or best of all time. But the idea is to make it onto the list, the album has to surpass some constant threshold uh, um, you know, uh, and the threshold that's the same for every, uh, for every year the album might come from. One of the best known such lists is the Rolling Stone 500 Best Albums of All Time. They released this initially in 2004. If you just bin the albums into the years in which they were originally released, you get this picture. So you see that uh, the world was getting better from about 1960 to 1970, and pretty much it's been going to hell since then. <laughs> Tells you something maybe about the age of, you know, Jan Venner or something like that. But turns out there are many, many such lists. I found, this is one of those what I did with my summer vacation a couple of summers ago slides. What, what this shows, each, uh, each row of dots is a, a different list from, uh, from a critic or a critical outlet of some sort like Rolling Stone or whatever. Uh, there are quite a lot of these that cover the period since 2000, but there are a fair number that cover the period back to, to 1960. What I'm going to do is construct indices out of each of these lists and then statistically splice them together to create an overall list of, or index rather, not list, but index of, well, I'll call it quality, but again, I put that in quotes. Before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the validity of, of, these, uh, of these lists. So I have a bunch of lists from a bunch of critics. And you know, one view might be these critics are all just kind of randomly choosing stuff. It's just noise. There's no signal here. But if you look at the, uh, the lists covering the period since 2000, so I have quite a lot of those lists, and you, you look at the concordance, or you can ask, how much concordance is there among those lists? And there's actually quite a lot. So in that period, there's something like a half a million albums released. It's a little hard to say exactly, but half a million is a conservative estimate. Uh, not, you know, notwithstanding that, of about 40 some lists I have covering this period, 32 of those lists included Radiohead's album Kid A on the list. 31 included Arcade Fire's Funeral album. 29 included The Strokes Is This It album. You know, this is the slide where I get to ask you, how many of you have any of these albums? And how about your kids? And so forth. Anyways, um, 
So, so, <laughs> uh, but my point is there's quite a lot of concordance. I mean, if you construct, like, what fraction uh, of, uh, of lists do you need to, to kind of, or what fraction, you don't need that many albums to cover a lot of what people consider good. So there's lots of concordance among these lists. Now, a critic could say, yeah, they're just copying each other, and maybe that's true. Maybe this is just some kind of social construction, but it's, it's a social construction that's correlated with consumption behavior. The last column has the recording industry certifications. So gold means half a million, platinum means a million, multi times platinum means multi-millions. My point is that if you look at this, and I, this list goes on, but if you look at the, the list I have, uh, about half of the, these most critically acclaimed albums are gold or better, which is quite unusual. You know, the median, uh, median amount of sales is like very close to zero, if you look across all half million albums that were released in this period. So it's correlated with demand. It's not perfectly correlated. You're not seeing Britney Spears on there uh, and so forth. But, but what you are seeing is, is you know, economically consequential. All right, so what do I do uh, with these indices? So define this thing, why IT is going to be the number of albums from index I originally released in year T. Right, so I go, varies across, I have all these different indices, like 100 of them, so I goes from 1 to 100. The T's here are just the years from like 1960 to the present. Uh, and so I take the natural log of that, so I'm putting this in percent terms to, uh, to not allow the absolute size of the indices to influence anything. I just am concerned with the percent changes in the index, in each index across years. I, I, I run a regression of that on an index fixed effect, a common time effect and an error term, and what I'm interested in is the common time effect. So that's the statistical version of splicing these indices together to ask, are they moving up, or, or is the, kind of the signal underlying all of them moving up or down? And here's what, here's what you get. It looks a fair bit like the Rolling Stone index, because that was one of a relatively small number going back prior to the recent period. It rises to 1970, it falls, it's rising in the 90s, and then it's coming down toward 2000. I've covered the recent period with a, a modesty stripe. Uh, any, any guesses? I mean, a couple points to make before we even remove the modesty stripe. The index was falling prior to Napster. And, you know, uh, well, that gives it away post and after constancy, but what, here's what happens. It goes flat. So, two points to make. One is, this is a pretty strong contrast to what's happening to revenue, right? This is a pretty con a strong contrast to the sky is falling revenue story. Plus, if you want to push harder, you could say, well, gee, it was falling and now it's constant. So, uh, well, compared to falling, it's rising. Well, okay, whatever. I sound like that six-handed economist. But, but anyways, it's certainly, I mean, what I take away from this, uh, uh, you know, a couple things. One, no reduction in quality following Napster. Quite a contrast with the sky is falling story. But there are a lot of things not to like about this. First of all, it is based on critics who are elites as opposed to based on actual, you know, if my concern is with the service flow generated by stuff, I really want to know what people are consuming more than what's happening in the very right tail of some distribution. So, um, so this is interesting, but when I found other data, I dropped this stuff like a hot potato and went to approach two. I mean, I kept it in the paper, but, but this is, I think, the, the more important stuff in some sense. So what do I do here? I'll, I'll try to be really clear about this. Um, so I want to construct a measure of vintage quality based on service flow slash consumption decision. What I have is sales and airplay. I should say what I wish I had, it's just an interesting aside, I wish I had what does exist. I wish I had the Nielsen data, you know, sales by track and, and, or, and or album by week and you know for every track when it was originally released and so forth. I talked to Nielsen about getting those data. They said that would be a million dollars. <laughs> so I went a different route. Um, I'm not kidding, actually. I mean, a million dollars. And yeah. Is there an academic discount? OK, so anyways, uh, here's the idea of this approach. If one vintage's music is better than another's, its greater appeal should generate higher sales or greater airplay through time after accounting for depreciation. So the notion is going to be, and I'll just show you the notion in a picture, um, but the notion is going to be at any, for, for any particular calendar year, if you look at what's being played on the radio or sold, and I'll have some data on airplay and some data on sales, not quite the, the data I can't afford, but something. Um, so I'll talk about the picture, then talk about the specifics. So this is the vintage distribution of songs aired in 2008. And so a lot of them are from this year, some from last year, year before, and so forth. And it kind of it goes back. And this is just if you were to keep going but, but uh, magnify this end of the distribution, you see it continues 
Uh, and what's important about this is the airplay data these are based on are based on very large numbers of spins, like millions of spins per year. That is the number of times a song gets played on the radio. And so with millions of spins, I am able to get these pretty accurate estimates of the share for each vintage, even going far back. Okay. So I observe that for 2004 through 8, so it's five years, the annual share of aired songs originally released in each prior year from a data source called Media Guide. So again, it's over about a million spins a year, and it's lots of data, so I get these pretty smooth looking uh, uh, depreciation curves, if you like. So far, this isn't the answer to any question. This is just the depreciation. If you want a hint about how I'm going to answer the question, the idea would be, well, we're going to have some depreciation, but over and above depreciation, are there some vintages that get played a lot? Or less than a lot? That's sort of how the, uh, how the method is going to proceed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's accounted for in the sense that what I'm looking at is the share of music played that's from each original vintage. So I'm, I'm not going to rely on the quantity of music used at any point in time, sold or aired, but rather of the music that's being used, what share is from each previous vintage. Yeah, but to the extent that the shifts in radio stations have influenced that share. Right. I, I mean, so for example, uh, usually about 15 years after an era we get nostalgic about it. And then we get a format called 70s nostalgia, heaven for Fent, right? Uh, or, and, but I'm just going to treat that as the phenomenon. We have that station playing the music that it plays because now we care about that particular genre, right? I mean, we don't, maybe we don't have a 70s. We have a lot of 60s nostalgia still, and that's going to be very much phenomenon. 60s nostalgia, even though the 60s was a long time ago, is a hint maybe the 60s were actually, in fact, a good period for music. But hold the thought, because it's, I'm also going to have sales data, and I'm also, as I say, uh, I also had the, the, um, the critic stuff, each of which is going to be differently susceptible to certain, certain aspects uh, like this one, or certain concerns like this one. Let me talk about the sales data. So do hold the thought, and, and let's see if, it, if, any, if the stuff of various things I do withstand the concern. Okay, so the sales data, as I say, I don't have the, the, the precise data I wish I had, but I do have those sales certifications from the Recording Industry Association. So I know I have like 20,000 such certifications for the U.S. That those are instances in which sales of an album hits half a million or a million or whatever. And so I know then at that point it's sold half a million. I know when it was released. And so if I just apportion uniformly over time, back from the time it was released to the time the certification occurs, and it usually occurs pretty soon after release, uh, I'm able to get a, you know, a non-crazy measure of, of, uh, of sales by vintage and time. I should say the certification-based sales account for 50-60% of overall sales. So it's not everything, but it's not trivial. Okay. Oh, there's a few other details there. I eliminate greatest hits albums because those aren't really from the year in which the song was released. Uh, so it would misstate. Anyways, when I do that, and I take all these certification data and then ask, what fraction of the albums selling this year were released this year? That's this column zero, and it's like 45%. Last year, 18, and so forth. And it smoothly declines. This is aggregating across all the years in the data. And so I get some smoothness there. But to get back to the question I want to address with these data, after accounting for music age, are particular vintages sold and aired more or less? And so for that, here, here's what I do. This is a little bit of a geeky slide, but you know, define STV as the share of vintage V music in the sales or airplay uh, in period calendar year T. So I'm going to observe that for multiple vintages and multiple years. In the sales data, I have like 30 or 40 years of data, of sales data going back prior to that. In the airplay data, I have five years of sales data, but many years of vintage data. So, um, now, I'm going to observe this share for this multiple vintages in years. For a given year, S is going to vary across vintages for two reasons. reasons. Depreciation, the thing I want to just get rid of, but is clearly an important phenomenon. And then variation in vintage quality. And so what I'll literally do is run a regression of the natural logarithm of this STV on age dummies. So what I'm going to do is let the data flexibly tell me how much less older stuff gets played or purchased. So I'm not going to be parametric about depreciation. The data will tell me, and, and we'll see the, we can see the depreciation patterns that get estimated. They're nice, smooth, and monotonic. But after accounting for that, 
I can also identify these vintage effects. And that's what I'm interested in. Okay, so the vintage dummies are my index or indices of vintage quality. Is that a hand or? No, stretch. Okay, the resulting airplay index, so using the airplay data, looks a little bit familiar. It rises to 1970, comes down, there's a little bump in the mid 90s. Any guesses? Actually, any? You probably don't have yet. No, no guesses. All right, nobody likes guessing games. It goes up rather substantially. Okay, now what does that mean? It means conditional on the age of this recent music, it's getting played more on the radio, right? So given its age, it gets played more than other music of similar ages did at different points in time, which is consistent with music getting better in the sense of yielding higher service flow, better only in that kind of mechanical sense or non-aesthetic sense. How about the sales-based index? Now this one's bumpier looking, because as I say, I only have these certifications. I don't have the underlying smooth, you know, millions of observations that I wish I had. Nevertheless, it has this peak in 1970, it's declining. I'll take away the suspense, it's killing us all. There we go. It rises, you know, and rather substantially. So in both sales and airplay, we're back to quality levels not seen since the Doobie Brothers were active. <laughs> okay, trying not to reveal my aesthetic biases. But what's the bottom line? I mean, there's no evidence that vintage quality has declined. There's some, and I would argue the, the better evidence that's based on actual decisions, uh, some evidence that it has increased. Of course, it's hard to know what might otherwise have been, right? So you might prefer to have, I mean, I would prefer to have another planet where we didn't have piracy, but we just had these shocks to, uh, to the supply side, and maybe we'd be living in even a more golden age than the age that's sort of goldenish, as, you know. Uh, and so I don't know, I cannot answer that question, but certainly compared to the claim that the sky is falling compared to history or recent history, that doesn't seem to be true by this metric at all. So it's a big contrast to the major uh, record labels views, but you know, we are left with something of a puzzle. Why is this thing I call quality up despite the collapse of revenue? And so that's what really gets us to, to today's the, the advertised uh, paper. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me try to, to talk about this puzzle. Um, and so there's this, this wonderful principle, the nobody knows nothing principle. With Caves cites it, but it's really this screenwriter, William Goldman, who said nobody knows nothing. And the idea was that even after a movie got made, nobody could predict which ones are going to be successful. And it seems to be true in a lot of media industries. Uh, music, books, movies, I don't know what other, you know. And something like 10% of, of products succeed. So, you know, you go ahead, you undertake the investment, and then, you know, most of them fail. Now, a second element of this story, and I'm borrowing here from this interesting paper by Marco Tervio. Uh, it, traditionally, it has been expensive to experiment. I'm using his word here, but meaning that you don't know whether it's going to be liked until you bring it to market. You undertake that expensive process of actually bringing it to market and finding out if consumers like it. Um, with music, you know, as recently as last year, the IFPI was saying, hey, it cost us a million dollars to bring a new record to market. And that's a new record by a new artist. If it's an established artist, it costs us like two, three million. Right now, we could argue about what, about, you know, exactly how to interpret their numbers. But I'm going to take that to mean that they earnestly mean that it's expensive to bring products to market. And I think that's right. Using these traditional means, you know, uh, recording in a, in a fancy studio, giving advances, making a video, bribing radio stations. It's, and, and you know, I know it's not legal to bribe radio stations, but there still is this process of hiring people to get you know, music added on the radio. So that it's part of the cost of bringing an album to market. It costs a million, I, I believe them. They say it costs a million dollars. It costs a million dollars. And so what is the traditional world? Well, we choose a small number of artists, we being the, the record industry, the major record labels for the most part. Choose a small number of artists and bet on them. And then because this is a hard context for prediction, most fail, we get a few good products out of that, you know, the 10% of the original few is the new few times point, you know, one. Now, along comes digitization, and, and so what does that do? Well, it has whatever effects it has on the demand side, that's the piracy stories we've been talking about, but then it also has these effects on the supply side. And I think it's, it's pretty obvious that there have been big effects on production and distribution, um, it's pretty much, well, it's close to free to do both of these things. Um, production can happen pretty effectively with, I'm told, with an iPhone, but certainly with a computer like this one. Uh, distribution, you don't have to print albums anymore. You can just upload things at CD Baby. For $10, you can make your song available at iTunes. And so that's pretty inexpensive. Now, there is still a question about promotion. Of course, you know, there are lots of songs. Is promotion also, uh, uh, has that been digitally changed? 
And so it's true that traditionally radio has been a bottleneck, but now at least it's plausible to suppose, and I'll try to show you evidence about this, that there is now there are other ways for consumers to learn about songs, other ways for, for artists to get access to consumers, you know, through internet radio, online criticism. And if that's all true, then that would mean it has become cheaper to experiment. That is to throw something out in the market and have enough people listen to it to figure out whether they like it so that we as a society, let's say, can figure out whether it's good stuff. If that's true, we could end up discovering more, at, uh, more artists with ex post, that is after people have listened and discerned, more ex post value. So this is my candidate possible explanation. Uh, now, if it's true, it has a bunch of implications. So let, let me sort of talk through how I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you a little tiny model that rationalizes increased quality, although frankly, I think I've already given you the intuition. It has a bunch of questions that it implies, and then I'm just going to go to piles of data that I've collected to try to answer these, these questions and give you the results. OK, so um, you know, again, the, the, little, the little model here, you know, this is, what are we thinking about? Generically, you have this problem that you have to make an investment uh, before you know whether something's going to succeed. So you have to make a guess. You're a label or a movie studio or a book publisher. You have to make a guess. And so you form a guess. And your guess is the truth, Q plus an error, some kind of random error. So the, your guess is Q prime. And you bring this product to market if your guess is bigger than some threshold. Right? So you expect it to be successful enough that you, you're going to go ahead and do it. Now let's say that cost reduction trumps piracy so that on balance digitization um, reduces T, that is, it reduces the threshold. Now, we know this is true, and it's just in the sense that look at the number of new products, both literally made available for sale, and I'll show you data about kind of how many things people have access to. So I think this is an innocuous and true assumption. Innocuous because true assumption. And so digitization is going to uh, reduce T, therefore raise the number of projects that can be brought to market. What happens to the volume of good work available to consumers? Well, it's going to hinge a lot on the extent of these errors, these epsilons. So let's start out in a world where marketability is completely predictable. Right? So there's no error. Well then, this is my paint, like, like uh, my paint crayon graph, but so here's the old threshold, and that stuff used to get brought to market, and now we have digitization. Here's the new threshold. The gain is something, but it's just a bunch of kind of marginal stuff in the world with full predictability. But of course, that's not the world. That's not the world of artistic or, or media products at all. Uh, here, now that we bring products with all expected quality above this T prime, we're going to end up with lots of products that are better than the old T. Right? I mean, just imagine the extreme of randomly taking draws. Suppose we had no ability to predict at all. Anything that increased the number of draws we could take would increase the number of draws that ended up in the right tail. Meaning, and for me, I'm thinking about that as ending up being important to consumers. So they'll sell a lot and so forth. And so the release of products with less, you know, Thinking bottom line on this digitization and the reduction in T is the release of products with less ex ante promise leads to a greater number of products with ex post success and value in the sense of generating surplus. Now, is this explanation right? So here I just articulate the questions in words, and then the rest of this will be about looking at data. First off, are there more new products to choose from? Uh, including those that have less ex ante promise, those that would have been on the cutting room floor to mix my media metaphors. Um, and here I'm going to think about that as indie label stuff versus major label stuff. Is there a changed information promotion environment? So, you know, I, I try to show you some evidence about uh, whether consumers have new ways to learn about this proliferation of new music. Uh, are there changed paths to commercial success? So I'm going to show you some data about the roles of traditional radio airplay as well as internet radio and, uh, and critics, many of whom are now uh, distributed on the internet. Um, are there different paths to success? If we look at those who turn out to be successful, those artists, those albums, is there a changing share that's been on the radio, let's say? Is sales concentration rising or falling? Now, the reason I ask this question is, you know, think about if you have a ton of new products, but they were all just crap. Nobody wanted them. It would have no effect on sales concentration. On the other hand, if you had a, a great number of new products, some of which drew demand, both from people who didn't consume before and as well as drawing demand away from existing kinds of products, you'd see uh, the sales concentration was falling. So that would be an interesting thing to look at. And then finally, and I guess this is kind of the punchline, do the products with less ex ante promise, like the indie artists or indie albums, uh, would not really have been released in a, in a meaningful way. They would have been released but they wouldn't have been discoverable in some sense to consumers. Do they account for a rising share of the ex post 
successful, um, commercially successful products? Those are the questions. Now, here's just an anecdote, uh, which I think summarizes. So <laughs> I keep saying I'll get to the data, and I will. But here's an anecdote that tells the story kind of nicely. Another one of these slides about an album your kids might have. Um, so Arcade Fire's album, The Suburbs. Uh, this album came out, actually I have this album too. I went to see Arcade Fire with my daughter. So, uh, and I think, I guess she introduced it to me, but whatever. So this album came out August 3rd, 2011, Merge Records. It was, this was a critically acclaimed band. They'd, they'd done well before critically, but hadn't sold much. Um, this album had critical acclaim. I'll talk a little more later about uh, Metacritic. Metacritic is this website that reports um, uh, album reviews turn into two-digit numbers. If three or more critics report a review, Metacritic reports a review. This album got 87. Previous albums had also gotten good scores. This is a very good score at Metacritic. This album had um, very little conventional airplay. I have some Billboard airplay data that I'll show you later. It didn't ever appear on the Billboard top airplay chart. Okay? But it was pretty big on internet radio. So if you go to uh, Last FM, so Last FM, it's not hard to get data from them. You can see that this, this album or this song, Ready to Start, got played quite a lot uh, at Last FM. Now, those of you, this is the iSchool, so you know that Last FM data have challenges. This, I can't distinguish Scrabbles from served up plays, uh, so I don't know completely whether this is uh, radio promotion via Last FM versus just people listening of their own volition. Nevertheless, there's a lot of listening to this song that went on at Last FM in a period when it wasn't on ter terrestrial radio in any detectable way. The album also went on to be successful. It sold more than half a million copies, so it was certified gold by the Recording Industry Association. It also won the Best Album Grammy for 2011. So that's a variety of measures of success. And of course, this year, uh, the Mumford & Sons album, you could probably tell a similar story about that being the best album of the year. And so what is this uh, anecdote about? Well, this anecdote is about you know, really circumventing a lot of the traditional uh, production, distribution, promotion channels and being successful nonetheless. Okay, but on to more systematic evidence. So uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I have as data to try to answer that big pile of questions. Um, so one, one thing that's surprised, been surprisingly difficult for me to obtain is a list of albums released year by year. Uh, so there are these neat sites like Music Brains and Discogs, and they seem rather thorough, and they certainly have every album you've ever heard of, but they have nowhere near the number of albums that Billboard says have been, or that Nielsen says have been released. So um, I, I do use, I will show you some time series about 1980 to 2010, and I use it because I can classify uh, albums by label type with a great deal of effort, um, and I want to see what's happening to indie and major, but I want to just be upfront that these are as much work as it was to put those together, they're, they're still very incomplete. And I can also look a little bit at physical versus digital in those. So that's one, and that's not the main source of data I rely on. Main source of data I rely on is a list or a set of lists of commercially successful albums. So here again, I wish I had the sales data, I don't, but what I do have is the weekly Billboard 200. So what is that? That's the top 200 selling albums uh, each week uh, reported in Billboard magazine, and uh, you know, they're ordered by sales rank. So I have that for this relatively long period of time. Uh, and I also do some stuff, which if you, we get really bored, I can tell you about my attempts to infer the sales from, uh, from the ranks using Pareto distributions and stuff. But the, the ranks themselves are pretty useful. I link those sales data with a bunch of things. Measures of traditional radio airplay. So by artist and year, was he or she on the radio that year in a big way? Measures of promotion on, on uh, internet radio, so were they at Last FM that year? Coverage by music critics, that is, were they at Metacritic that year? Whether they're on an independent label. So I, I link this stuff with this stuff uh, as a means to try to answer some of these, some of these questions. Uh, okay, so I, the, I, I shouldn't spend too long on here, except this, this is just me whining again about how hard it was to try to turn these Discogs data into really a time series of the number of major label and independent label. Why is that hard? You know, it doesn't just say major label. Like it says one of many, many, many imprints. There are like 60,000 record labels in these data, and you don't know who owns them. And so I hired a series of research assistants, you know, all of whom kind of left tearing their hair out. The last one was one of my daughters, uh, and even, even, and she made it pretty far, but, uh, so that's the de de dejected looking Napoleon, because I think of this label project as the, my Waterloo. Uh, all right. Fortunately, I can do a lot of stuff with, without leaning too heavily on it. 
Uh, I think I've already said this. Well, I didn't say where these data literally came from. I mentioned the Billboard 200. The indie data are from the Billboard independent chart. So they've been reporting a top indie album, and it's nice because I can merge those easily since it's from the same source. Um, on promotion, so I, I've mentioned this, but let me just talk about it for a second, uh, just partly to, well, for a variety of reasons. The Billboard 100 is, for some strange reason, the 75 top songs of the week, and I have that for 20-some years. Um, it, when I've had glimpses of more comprehensive airplay data, I've been able to learn what share of airplay I'm accounting for with this. It's not nearly as much as I would have hoped. Maybe it's 35%. So I'm missing, I've just got you know, the big tip of the iceberg on this stuff, and so I have to be straightforward that any claim I make about things being getting airplay or not is, is about whether they have lots of airplay as opposed to just some airplay. I have a little bit of data from another source that has the top 200 by week. And then last FM, I keep mentioning, they report the top 420 songs by week. So uh, that's a bit, a bit more coverage. The critic stuff, I mentioned Metacritic, but I'll just say a little more. Metacritic appeared in 2000, and it grows over this period, so it's covering about 1,000 albums a year in 2010. Okay. All right, and then the sales certifications um, I've mentioned. I'm not going to make much of them today. All right, so let's get back to those. These are the four, was it four or five questions I claimed I would try to answer. So the first question is just about growth and releases. Now, this relies, so there are two facts. Maybe the best fact here is the small font fact up top. According to Nielsen, there were 35,000 new products in 2000, 100,000 in 2010. Okay, uh, and I've gotten that from various press accounts. I don't have those Nielsen data. Um, if you look at Discogs, you see something similar. You see a growth in the number of albums. This goes back to 1980, actually. You see things rising. Actually, you see things falling a bit at the end of the period. The colors are, uh, well, self-released are these blue things. Major label things are this kind of mustard color stuff. Indie is this red stuff. And then green is unknown. A whole lot of releases where I couldn't classify them. And you know, to make it even more depressing, this doesn't sum to nearly the quantity of albums that Nielsen says exists. So this is at, um, at best suggestive about the growth in importance of number one, self-release stuff, and number two, indie stuff. OK. How about the changing information environment? By the way, my, my answers get better after that first one. <laughs> um, all right, so traditional radio, as I say, the Billboard Airplay data have the top 75 songs per week. So what is that? 52 times 75, 3,900 listings per year. But if you uh, collapse them to artists, you have about 300 distinct artists per year on, the, on this Billboard 100, whatever. I don't know why they call it 100. But. Now contrast that with traditional radio or internet versus traditional. So I compare the Billboard list with the last FM top four, 420. Now interestingly, the number of distinct artists is not that much bigger, in part because listing at Last FM goes much deeper on the album. So the number of artists is not terribly, it's like 350 or something. What I do is I, I just look at the overlap between what's getting a lot of airplay, according to Billboard, and what's being heavily played via Last FM. And the overlap's about 10%. And I kind of like this, uh, this table. What on the left-hand side, we have the top Billboard artists who are not on the Last FM list. Right-hand side, we have the top Last FM artists not on the Billboard list. And they're really rather different. You know, these are the things that like, teenagers listen to. Uh, I was, we had satellite radio in our car, and uh, there's a station called 20 on 20, which is the top 20 songs counted down every three hours. And my kids used to like this, and I just called it the soundtrack of hell. Uh, <laughs> But anyways, that's this, the soundtrack of hell. And over here, we have some different stuff, much more indie-focused, although you know, the Beatles, of course, aren't indie, but it's a rather different list. I mean, by construction, it's not overlapping, but, uh, but it is really rather different. And my takeaway from this is that internet radio allows promotion for artists with less promotion on traditional radio. Now, I want to be clear. I mean, I wish I observed all radio airplay. I wish I observed listening on Pandora. I have just not succeeded in getting well, I have a happy slide at the end. I may have succeeded in getting the rest of the radio airplay, but that's a, that's a different story. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I, there's actually a serious question to think about there. I don't, I don't know. No, no, and I know. I mean, the other thing about all this, by the way, is um, I'm going to treat the world as though, I'm going like, to treat the world as though there's one listener. If I could break data down by different consumers, 
Like when I, when I did my quality index, I would love to do a quality index by country or by consumer type. If I only had micro data, I could. I can maybe do it by country now because of some data I've come into lately. Uh, but I would love to be able to do it if I had micro data on what people are listening to, then I could actually see whether certain vintages are good for certain kinds of consumers versus others. Uh, and so I've thought about that, just haven't had the opportunity. Okay, so point number one about this information environment is that yes, uh, it seems that there's, there are ways to communicate about new products that, that aren't getting communicated about through traditional channels. This is just a way to characterize the Metacritic data. So what I've done here is I take all the reviews there and then I ask, uh, when, did the, uh, when did that review site appear? So for example, here's Rolling Stone appearing in the you know, mid-60s, and what, some number of reviews there, uh, 20 of the 20,000, so, some big chunk of reviews came from there, and then uh, a bunch of reviews came from sources that sort of started up later. The point of this slide is that there's a, a change in the curvature here, especially into this internet era. So I, I'm thinking especially of sources like Pitchfork. So Pitchfork was founded about 2000. It's a purely internet but very influ or, and very influential uh, uh, critical site that reviews new albums. What I'm trying to say with this picture is that especially lately there's been a growth both in the number of these sources of information and it, what's also true is that these are all accessible for free. So the, the, you know, how much information do consumers have available to them easily about these new products? It seems to have grown, uh, complementing what's happening literally with what they can listen to. Okay, uh, so evolution of sales concentration. Uh, so what do I do here? Again, I don't actually observe uh, sales, so I can't calculate sales concentration directly. So uh, what, what do I do? Well, here first of all, just a reminder, is kind of the experiment we're living through growth in the number of products available. And if more products were achieving at least some relative commercial success, I mean, I realize that overall sales are declining, but the question is, is the, uh, the, the share that, you know, the, the, the tail is getting, is it growing relative to the head of the distribution? So here's how I do it. I look at the number of albums uh, that enter the Billboard 200. Now, of course, there are 200 in a week, but in a year, there could be anywhere between 200, if 200 stayed there all year, or 10,400 if, if each entered for a week and stayed for a week. The, uh, uh, you know, so it could be anywhere between 200, 10,000, 400. As it turns out, it's a number like this. Between 85 and about 98 or so, it averages five, 600 per year. Well, then it rises substantially. It goes from the 600-ish to about, I don't know, almost 1,100 or so. So it nearly doubles in the last decade. And that's at least suggestive that new products, which would earlier not have existed, are taking some market share away from existing, well, that's a tendentious way to say it, but they're taking some market share uh, at the denominator expense <laughs> of, the, of the, they might be just, you know, in, I mean, the problem with saying that they are expanding the market is that, of course, the market's not expanding, so it's a little hard to know. Relative to the shrinking market, they're, you know, so it's, uh, it's a funny kind of a three-handed economist thing to say. All right, um, so, but I mean, on, on that one, on that last one, I just want to, you know, it really does look like the growth in products is deconcentrating sales in an interesting way. Now, how about success and promotional channels? Uh, what's happening to the role of traditional airplay among successful artists? And again, interpret this as traditional heavy airplay, so appearance on the Billboard uh, 100, top, top 75 songs of the week. Uh, and what's happening to the role of critics? So here's one thing I can do. I can look at my Billboard 200, the artists on that year by year, and ask what share of them are also on that top airplay list. And going back to 91, we see uh, it's the numbers like 30%, and it actually is declining, you know, even before 2000, but it seems to be declining more quickly since 2000. So the role airplay is playing seems to be declining, possibly as a continuation of some uh, pre-existing trend. It's even true at the very top of the distribution. So if you look at the billboard, the tw top 25 by week, and aggregate them together to the year, and then ask um, what share of the top 25s, and you know, that used to be a number like 50%, maybe there's a trend there, but there's certainly a trend recently. So even among the most successful, most commercially successful albums, uh, Airplay is playing less of a role than it used to. We can look at a, at a different picture and ask, how about what share of these commercially successful albums are being reviewed at Metacritic? And that one has the opposite 
Now, this one only goes back to 2000. And it, you know, it goes along 15, 20%, and then it rises. Now, part of this, I have to admit, is mechanical, or might be mechanical, in the sense that the number of albums covered at Metacritic is rising. So some of it would be mechanical. Of course, there are so many albums um, that it wouldn't necessarily happen, but I mean, it's, the, the airplay numbers, on the other hand, it's hard to see how those are mechanical, but this one, I have to say, if I were gonna criticize me, I would raise that concern. Okay. Now, ex ante promise and ex post success. Uh, here's the question. Do the artists with less ex ante promise, who would not have made it, and I should have probably wor added the word meaningfully, made it meaningfully to market, because you know, in the sense of this Tervio experimentation idea, it doesn't really mean anything to simply be released. It has to be possible for enough people to listen to you and know you for you to become something that can, and can spread. But anyways, do the artists with less ex ante promise now achieve great, uh, now achieve sales success. And so the way I implement this is with the indies, do the indies account for a growing share of sales? And the answer is simply yes. For the Billboard 200, it goes from about 13% to about 35 or something. So it's roughly a tripling, almost a tripling of the, the share of commercially successful. It's even true at the top end of the distribution, the Billboard 25, where it goes from about six to about 18. Um, and so it really does seem to be, uh, um, does seem to be different. So let me wrap up this middle paper, then talk about where I'm going next. And please ask questions. You've been way too polite. Um, so uh, although I criticize myself enough, so maybe that's fair. So what do I conclude from this? Digital disintermediation, this process of uh, not necessarily using these traditional labels and distribution mechanisms and promotion mechanisms, provides a possible explanation for the increased quality. Remember the motivation, the puzzling motivation that, that started all this was, looks like quality's increased, even though revenue is tumbling. And how could that be? Now you could just avoid this whole paper and say, well, you know, costs fell, so that's enough to do it. But still, even why would, you, why would things get better? And I think there's something special about music products and other creative products that means that whatever gives us more experimentation actually ends up giving us a lot more good stuff. So given this unpredictability at the time investment occurs, more experimentation leads to discovery of more good music, a lot of which really wouldn't have been available to consumers uh, before digitization occurred. So that's my, that's my claim. And so uh, my changing face of digitization is, is you know, from this, that's my pre-Damascus experience. There's my post-Damascus experience. Um, okay, let me talk a little bit about where I'm going now that I've parted the Red Sea. Or I haven't, but I've seen it parted by somebody. So I, all these data co complaints I've been having, um, the data I can't afford and the data I can't get, I've started this project with some folks at the European Commission and I'm able now, or I will able, be able to soon revisit a lot of questions that interest me with uh, something like the right data for not just the US, but for 18 countries, including the US. And so I was sightseeing in, uh, in Sevilla last week, or two weeks ago, and that was a nice sight. That's a, you know, a Moorish influenced church. Yeah, that's nice. But this is way nicer. I don't know if you can see this. This is a state of regression with 93 million observations. Uh, of the data that I would ne had never been able to get my hands on, but now. And so I'm, I'm gonna have sales of every digital song in 18 countries, and airplay of every song on the radio in 18 countries uh, for seven and 10 years, respectively. So I may be going to Sevilla a lot more. Um, and so with those data, what I'll be doing is I can sort of re-ask all the questions I have been asking, but also thinking about things like the globalization of digital music sales and you know, winners and losers from this frictionless long tail trade, the evolution of this quality and service flow stuff that I've been talking about, but now for every country, because I observe consumption separately by country. Um, I can think about the growth of new products and sales concentration and product discovery in, in all these different places, and so it should be, it should be kind of fun. The other thing I wanted to mention, uh, this is another project that I've been working on that, that this project very much led me to, was to think about another medium, which is books. I've been doing some stuff on movies, we could talk about later, but I've been thinking about books. So if you think about this digital disintermediation business, right? there's no medium where it's easier to disintermediate than in books where all you need is a, well, you need a computer and the ability to render a PDF and then upload to Kindle, the Kindle Direct Publishing Program, and now you have a product that's for sale. Now, the fact that it's for sale doesn't really mean anything, uh, but you know, if you look at what's happening in that, in that market, 
we have this explosion of new products. The number of new self-published, especially digital, but there are also self-published paper books. We also have, uh, we have lower prices from a variety of sources. The self-published things tend to be very inexpensive. They're often priced, well, many of them are free, but then there are others that are 99 cents or $3. And even the traditionally published things are cheaper. But maybe even more exciting is that we have so many more draws from the urn, so many more products coming to market. And the question is, are all these new products having any effect on consumers? And so I've been spending a lot of the last few months collecting data on this, trying to answer it. I'll just give you one, one teaser fact. If you look at the USA Today bestseller list, which is the top 150 sellers by week, and by the way, USA Today seems to be the only honest bestseller list out there, in the sense that unlike the New York Times, which says we do not systematically cover self-published books, or others that say, we do not cover books if their price is below $5. Do they work for the industry or something? In any event, these, this is the honest list from USA Today, now my favorite newspaper. And the share of books originally self-published, now they're not currently necessarily self-published, because what often happens is a book is self-published, it becomes very successful, and then a press says, hey, hey, let me buy you, I'll buy you out, and then I'll sell you, promote you, and so forth. So you all know about Fifty Shades of Grey, and Fifty Shades of Grey, which of course I haven't read, um, occupies four slots on the list. Why four, you say? It's a trilogy? Because the box set is also always in the top 150, usually the top 10. But anyways, the share of these 150 um, that are self originally self-published, well, in romance, it's 30%. Overall, overall, it's 10%. But this is the category where it's most extreme, romance, where it's 30%. So, you know, is this sort of digital disintermediation going to be a big deal in books? Yeah, I think so. It's going to be a huge deal in books. And it's really happening right now. And it's, it's kind of fun to study because unlike music, where digitization arrived as this, as this negative threat, as the, as the threat on the piracy side, uh, here digitization seems to be moving in a more organic way in the sense that somebody, in this case Amazon, figured out let's create a market before it gets ahead of us. And uh, well, I'm not saying it's unambiguously good, but there are some interesting things happening. So that's my story. <laughs>